Good morning. Nice to see you all today. You can take the masks off if you want, or you can leave them on, whatever makes you comfortable. So welcome. I invite you to stand as you are able and hear these opening words. Let us shape a space for the three. The spirit as breath of life, the bread as food of heaven, the love and relationship. Let us shape a space that tangles all three through our life and our worship, held in relationship and met here. Let us shape a space for the many faces of God woven together and revealed in each of us. On this Trinity Sunday, let us shape a space to be found together in worship. Our opening hymn is Holy, Holy, Holy. Let us sing together.
are gathering to celebrate Trinity Sunday on this Memorial Weekend. So welcome. Just um, a couple, well maybe just one announcement that I can think of. Starting on Tuesday, we will have a new um, person in our office helping do some work for the church and a lot of work for the Center for Children. Her name is Gabby. So um, just say a prayer of welcome and thanksgiving for her as she transitions and comes to join and connect with the vine when we celebrate her many gifts and all that she is going to offer the church and the Center for Children. I invite you now to go ahead and take a deep breath and center into a posture and an attitude of prayer. And as you do that, let me ask you if you have any prayer concerns or joys that you'd like to lift up on this Sabbath day. Nancy. Continued prayers for Nancy Riley. Bradley Smith. Prayers for Bradley Smith. And all of those prayers <laughs> that we have in our hearts. Let us go to God in prayer. O oh God, our three in one, three, the number that calls us out of individualism, the number that insists on relationship, I to you, we to another, the Trinity which connects and births networks, until all of your world, the cosmos, join together in one. One to create, one to save, one to sustain, one to author, one to seek justice. And one to enliven old, dry bones. One to conceive. One to die. And one to resurrect. One to plan. One to act. And one to explain. Three. Three in one, calling us out of individualism. One's sufficient. Two's company. Three is community. Oh God, your expression in Trinity exposes our self-reliance. It breaks open our exclusivity. And it brings us together in a spirit and an act of worship. May it be so. And now may we, in an act of community, join our voices together, interlocking and weaving together to pray the prayer. You have taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You can remain seated as we sing together Christ beside you.
Our scripture lesson comes from the third chapter of John, which is the story of Jesus and Nicodemus. There was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a Jewish leader. He came to Jesus at night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these miraculous signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered, I assure you, unless someone is born anew, it is not possible to see God's kingdom. Nicodemus asked, how is it possible for an adult to be born? It's impossible to enter the mother's womb for a second time and be born, isn't it? Jesus answered, I assure you, unless someone is born of water and the Spirit, it's not possible to enter God's kingdom. Whatever is born of the flesh is flesh, and whatever is born of the Spirit is spirit. Don't be surprised that I said to you, you must be born anew. God's spirit blows wherever it wishes. You hear its sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it's going. It's the same with everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus said, how are these things possible? Jesus answered, you're a teacher of Israel and you don't know these things? I assure you that we speak about what we know and testify about what we have seen, but you don't receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you don't believe, how would you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has gone up to heaven except the one who came down from heaven, the human one. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so must the human one be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. God so loved the world that God gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him won't perish, but will have eternal life. God didn't send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him isn't judged. Whoever doesn't believe in him is already judged because they don't believe in the name of God's only Son. The light came into the world and people loved darkness more than the light for their actions are evil. All who do wicked things hate the light and don't come to the light for fear that their actions will be exposed to the light. Whoever does the truth comes to the light so that it can be seen that their actions were done in God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So did that um, just sum it all up and clarify it for you? It just, just makes complete sense, doesn't it? I mean, John is just so point blank. He's really not. So John, the Gospel of John, which is not even considered a synoptic gospel. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke are so similar that they're lumped together in what we call the synoptic gospels. We can see that they share some source material. They share similar stories and um, written similar in time frame. The gospel of John is written much later, around the 90s, when we talked about the book of Revelation. It was written around the same time. So we have the book of Revelation that's very apocalyptic, very full of imagery, and the Gospel of John is very similar to that. John is very much connected to spirit, um, and you get kind of this other level of conversation about Jesus and about God from the Gospel of John. And so today is Trinity Sunday in the life of the church. It's the day that we proclaim the oneness of God and three in one and one in three, and it just makes total sense. And whenever anybody asks us to explain the Trinity, we can just say it so easily and so matter-of-factly, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I found that whenever anybody tries to explain the Trinity, it's confusing. It's, we get tripped up. We, we don't really know how to explain it. We 
often say, well, it's, it's God, three in one, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, or God, the one who created us, Jesus, the one who redeemed us, and the Holy Spirit, the one that sanctifies us, and that doesn't really clear it up, especially for people who are new to the walk of Jesus. Some of us really prefer to address in prayer or to relate to God, the Father, Creator, and, and whether we believe that there's a God sitting up on a throne, we often still conjure that image in our minds. Others of us really do relate to Jesus, knowing that it was someone who walked the earth, who talked, who, who taught. We have stories. They're, they're fairly concrete. He's a human, was a human, and so we have some relatability to that. And then there are others who really connect to spirit, that mystery, that breath, that wind. But putting them all together, God is one, it's a little challenging. We do our best to explain it to children. I've seen explanations of like water, ice, steam, you know, one, one object element, but expressed in different ways. God as one really is a connection and a community, a working together to be in a relationship with you. Enter Nicodemus. Nicodemus, who is a religious know-it-all. So the fact that Nicodemus is searching at night, and he, whenever John, the Gospel of John, talks about anything happening at night, or scripture anyway at night, pay attention to that. That's the writer's way of saying that there is some space of unknowing, that the person is, is wrestling with something. Night is kind of a way of expressing this mystery. So Nicodemus, this religious know-it-all, is searching and seeking and strikes up a conversation with Jesus, of all people. Nicodemus seems to be wrestling and working out his faith, his theology, his understanding of who God is, and seems to want to get beyond just head knowledge. He seems to really desire to have some kind of transformation of his heart. But the very reason that Nicodemus is searching and the very conversation that he has already lets us see the Trinity at work. So instead of, or just for a moment, consider not Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Think of God beyond God beside, God within. The God beyond has already been working in and around Nicodemus. Nicodemus would not have come to that spot at night without the working and prompting of God's grace. God had been forming and molding and sculpting. And then God shows up right beside him in the form of Jesus, to talk, to engage, to converse. And then Jesus peels another layer of the onion and reminds Nicodemus that God is within. So where does Nicodemus start on this desired transformation? Jesus says, you must be born again. Preacher Tom Long, one of my favorite preachers, he says this about this encounter between Nicodemus and Jesus. What Jesus told Nicodemus was shocking. Shocking to Nicodemus, maybe shocking to us too. Jesus said, Nicodemus, you don't need God in your life. You don't need God to come into your life. That's backwards. You need to come into God's life. God doesn't come into your life. It works the other way. God offers us God's own life as a gift and beckons us 
to enter it. You need to be in the life of God. In fact, Nicodemus, you need to be born all over again, this time born into God's life. Now, I don't know about you, but that's a real reversal for me to consider that we are invited to enter into God's life. When we baptize, we do so in the name of the Trinity because it brings you into the life of Christ, the life of God, the life of the Holy Spirit. It brings you into that life, soaking wet with that life. A life of mystery and creativity and sacrifice and breath. The story of Nicodemus, it narrates, it expresses, it paints the picture of the Trinity, God beyond, God beside, God within. Nicodemus at this moment realizes that God is so much bigger than what he had been taught, all the head knowledge that he had. I love uh, the novel The Shack. Have you read it? Um, and I'm not always, I mean, I'm pretty, I'm pretty skeptical about um, novels when it comes to stuff about theology, but I love the way The Shack describes the Trinity. So let me read to you just a part. So in the story, um, a, a person who has a very traumatic experience um, has this um, experience with God who shows up as three persons. Um, God is um, uh, the creator, Jesus, and Holy Spirit. And so the main character of the novel is trying to understand how God works. So here's what the main character, whose name is Matt, says to God, the three. I love the way you treat each other. It's certainly not how I expected God to be. You respond with such graciousness to each other. Isn't one of you more the boss than the other two? Don't you have a chain of command? And God responds. Though chains be of gold, they are not chains all the same. We have no concept of final authority, only unity. Max says, how so? And God responds, humans are so lost and damaged that to you it is almost incomprehensible that people could work or live together without someone being in charge. Every human institution, God continues, that I can think of, from political to business, even down to marriage, is governed by this kind of thinking. It's the web of our fabric. It's such a waste, says God. It's one reason why experiencing true relationship is difficult for you. When you choose independence over relationship, you become a danger to each other. Others become objects to be manipulated or managed for your own happiness. Authority, as you usually think of it, is merely the excuse the strong use to make others conform to what they want. In a selfish world, it is also used to inflict great harm. And then God kind of wraps it up by saying, you humans, repeating, you humans are so lost and damaged that to you it is almost incomprehensible that relationship could exist apart from hierarchy. So you think that God must relate inside a hierarchy like you do, but we do not. God relates and a spirit and expression of unity and relationship. That is what the Holy Spirit teaches us. That's how God lives and moves and has being. 
We are the ones who would prefer hierarchy. Because that means that someone is on top and someone is not. And someone is in and someone is out. And we hope that we'll be the ones who are in. But that's not God's way. God's way is a dance with movement, incorporating all in joy and pain and creativity. The Reverend John Buchanan has retired, and in an article, he shared a story looking back over his life of ministry. He remembered one Sunday service where he was baptizing a two-year-old boy, and after the child had been baptized with water, John, the pastor, following the directions of, he was Presbyterian, a Presbyterian prayer book, he put his hand on the little boy's head and addressed him in Trinitarian language. He said to this little boy, you are a child of God, sealed by the Spirit in your baptism, and you belong to Jesus Christ forever. Unexpectedly, the little boy, with water dripping down from his face, looked up and responded, uh-oh. <laughs> so today, we not only celebrate the expression of God in our lives, but we also celebrate or maybe take a first step towards being in God's life. Acknowledging that for many of us that we have been baptized, we are part of a community of transformative love. The love that drives us to love one another and transform the world. Uh-oh. Are you ready to be born again? To see the kingdom, to see the dream that God dreams, see and experience grace that is truly amazing and will wake you up every day knowing that you are loved. A kingdom that has a table so big, with so many seats that no one is left out. There's enough room for everyone to eat and be full. A kingdom that engages in conversation and compassion and not argument for the sake of winning. A kingdom where bodies are treated with health care no matter the age or stage or income. A kingdom where you are heard and held in forgiveness and peace. If you want to see that, then Jesus says, be born again into the relationship of God. Today, be born anew today. Be born anew tomorrow, next week, or in your next breath. Again and again, be born into the community of God beyond, beside, and within. And welcome to the dance of transformative love. Let us pray. I bind unto you myself today the strong name of the Trinity, by invocation of the same, the three in one and one in three. Christ be with me. Christ within me. Behind me. Before me. Comfort and restore me. Beneath me. Above me. Christ in quiet, Christ in danger. We join ourselves into the relationship of God beyond, beside, within. The three in one and one in three. May it be so. Amen. I invite you to stand as we sing our closing song, Holy, Holy. It's from the Faith We Sing Hymnal.
Sunday. Trip is going to be here along with Charles and going to be providing worship for you. Trip's already got like six or eight, a whole host of songs that he's ready to share um, and share them in a way that helps you connect with God in a spirit of worship. So hope you will be a part of that next Sunday. May you go forth from this place. Knowing that God invites you to be in relationship with God, in God, the God beyond, the God beside, and the God within. Go in that grace and that peace. Amen and amen. <coughs>